So love. Wir sind live. Sorry, das ist ein Sehr gut. So love. Okay, so I suppose we should switch to English now, right? Sure, sure, yeah. So yeah, that's let's probably wait. a good idea. <laughs> great, great. Okay. Uh, um, there are already people joined. Uh, yeah, slowly but surely. Um, so for everyone who's joining now, um, we're not starting yet. We're still waiting for one of our speakers. Um, so just so so all of you can come in and eat in, grab a beer, standard meetup stuff. So where is the pizza? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the beer. <laughs> uh, I just I just told uh, Rafi that I got myself spring rolls. Unfortunately, <laughs> I, I can't be pass them uh, to you. Special yeah, just, up spring rolls. You just share them with the hail. <laughs> so, six minutes left. Okay, let's see. So. Are, are we actually seeing what the audience is seeing at the moment? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> so then, then we should do some something more like it's it's pretty boring to watch us staring into our cameras. Sure, we, we have also a slider, so we can also sh share it here currently. So for the others to view. There will be a few questions for the beginning to, to check out who's currently watching the stream and so on. But we will start in five minutes. Do actually people watch our stream currently, Ariel? Or do we are still alone? I'm currently looking at the, trying to get the viewer numbers. Um, oh, I just, I just uh, now got the stream notification. Oh, so cool. it might be a bit delayed um, on that side. Yeah, it's, it seems like we have we we can see our only zero views. It's kind of no, we, we already have two viewers, two current viewers. But hmm? um, as I, uh, now I see it, now I see them. Yeah, as I figure, okay. um, the notifications probably need a little while to to go to go cool. out. But you can enter everything about meetup.com. Uh, meetup or so hopefully this will not make any issues. Let's see. I should see the stream online uh, when I search for it. Because a couple of minutes ago, I didn't see it um, when I when I searched for it. So I, I got a notification from a friend. Uh, it seems that the stream is working. <laughs> cool. All right, now we get the viewers in. We have seven viewers currently. Uh, three minutes until the official meetup starts. We're solid. Can we play some music? That would be an <laughs> idea, yeah, sure. <laughs> some some yeah. elevator music. <laughs> and everybody is waiting like this. So <laughs> Just with the hats and so on, yeah. I, I had a colleague recently that started to sing around once uh, he waits until the meeting started. Despite he was not so a great singer, but he was fully into us, just enthusiastic that he is one. Yeah, it was some sort of yeah guy. Um... Okay, so is the uh, is the other Stefan coming? Uh, I think so. Yeah, but he's still in a call actually, as it seems. Told me, but yeah, let's see. If not, we will start at seven. Uh, 
p.m. as we have planned. So mm. yeah. I mean, I don't mind. It's just yeah. Um, can you maybe uh, text him? And sure, I, I've texted him, but he is currently not answering. I don't know why. I mean, he he still has two minutes, so. Sure. Yeah. Well, maybe. maybe he's entered during the stream. It's also not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he can make seven sharp. That would be cool. I, I think. I think for every minute he comes late, he gets a more difficult question. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the end, it will be something about quantum physics and big data. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how he will hit. How he will answer. That's, that's, <laughs> but that that's easy, right? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Let's make something uh, harder, like a cameras configuration or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's also easy. <laughs> but on, on on the other end of easy. <laughs> <laughs> so the last minute, and we will start with the stream. Uh, we we call the stream, yeah, but with the discussion. <laughs> We, so, we, we, we will officially start with the screen. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> so, how many people are watching? Um, it takes a little while, but approximately 11 people are here already. Oh. Cool, cool. That's so, a good it's... amount for a first meeting. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I say we we start, and Stefan will just join us later on. Yeah, sure. If... Yeah, cool. So, and um, welcome to our first meetup from the Software Architecture Group. Um, my name is Rafael Atzenhofer. Uh, today I'm uh, presentation uh, moderating the. Big data edition of our software architecture meetup. And let's step right in and into, uh, let's make an introduction of our speaker. I think uh, let's start with Peter. Hi, I'm Peter. I'm <laughs> sorry, <laughs> wrong, wrong guy. Wrong, wrong button. <laughs> Not now it works. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I'm working for Accenture now since seven, seven and a half years. Um, I'm in Accenture with uh, with the architects and specialized on big data architects. And since also since like a year now, um, going also into cloud architecture and supported numerous um, different projects around um, mostly data, a lot in, in the banking sec section. So I also did a lot of the, the classical data stuff. So I worked for um, um data warehouse projects i i did data migrations all, all the the really boring stuff but i also did did set up um hadoop clusters and and supported this side of of the the more interesting stuff yeah so and i i think um maybe maybe a word or two how i got into into big data was more more or less like like an accident on my on my first project like let's say Actually, together with, with with Stefan from his um, now with with Claudiera, we actually set up a Hortonworks cluster. And I at first supported more the, the application side, so I was a Java developer back then and and did the integration. And then later on, found the the, the back end um, data stuff more interested and switched over to the to the big data to, to the dark side of of the force and. Um, sticked with it ever since. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's nice. So um, then, uh, Stefan, talk us, uh, tell us about something about you. Sure. Now, I actually have to start where um, Peter uh, stopped. Uh, yeah, we set up this cluster. Um, I, 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 if we look back, I started uh, technical physics. Um, I had to do with lots, uh, lo uh, loads amounts of data at CERN. Then I joined uh, Accenture, where um, I set up and secured several clusters. Uh, then I joined Hortonworks uh, as uh, a technical individual contributor in the professional services team, um, basically consulting our, our, our customers on 
how to set up uh, clusters and how to uh, deliver use cases, uh, develop applications on top of this. And uh, eventually, uh, uh, after the merger of Hortonworks and Cladera, I'm now a services delivery manager in the professional services team and overseeing uh, the business in Switzerland, Austria, and Eastern Europe. Uh, make sure that all the projects that we have uh, are completed successfully. Cool, cool. And last but not least, Bernhard. Yeah, hello, my name, my name is Bernhard Wartner. I'm currently working as uh, enterprise architect at Wiener Linien. Um, also from a past journey, I started to do this funny big data thing 10 years ago, even I did not know that this was called big data. So I started classically back when I uh, at my studies at TU Wien. Uh, and somehow uh, I then got uh, basically into consultancy and uh, basically started also to work in Austria on the, I would uh, now retro perspective and not call them big data project, but intentionally they were some. Um, then a couple of years ago, I, I joined Teradata and uh, focused more on international projects, more or less in the DAC region, but not only. Um, basically, uh, uh, on that from that perspective, I also started to program classically in that sense on the stock exchange, for example, uh, near Frankfurt. Also, uh, I worked, for example, for, in the German car manufacturing industry. And then uh, last year, I relocated basically back to Austria and started to work as an enterprise architect at uh, Wiener Linien. And now I'm happy to join this uh, conversation. So nice to have you here. Um, and also, I want to introduce our uh, service guy for the whole thing about the community. Uh, Ariel, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, I, I like the term service guy. Um, <laughs> my, name is, Sorry. my name is Ariel. Um, I will be doing um, audience service today um, together with Rafael and two other colleagues. Um, we, we kind of put this dream together. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited where this road uh, where this road is heading, um, and I, I hope for an for a successful first stream, you guys. So nice, nice, nice. So maybe I should also introduce myself. Actually, so I'm I'm also working at Accenture with Ariel in the same department for technology architecture. Uh, currently, my topic also is in the big data section where I'm setting up data pipelines for a customer and also develop an applications with Spark and so on. So I'm actually currently also in the big data topic. So that's about me. I would say let's start with our first uh, question, but the question is not for, for you guys. It's just actually for the audience. So um, for this purpose, let's uh, share a Slido. Uh, so we want to know uh, what are you doing actually? So what uh, the people in the stream currently want or working on? Are you a student? Are you a software engineer? So just uh, tell us what you're doing. Maybe let's give them a five minutes or so on. To <clears throat> initially open Slido so that they then sure. actively ask oh. questions. Let's see, sure. look at it. Well, it's just a word cloud. So you see a couple of works, you see a software architect, so we have students here. Oh, that's that's kind of nice. So computer science, software developers. Ooh. When do you ever stop being a student, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> Of course, yeah. this topic. <laughs> some some take it more literally, others more metaphorically. <laughs> yeah, especially since we're so in a fast evolving area, that's incredible. Sure, sure, yeah. But but it seems as everybody is something, but connected to a student life, so. <laughs> ah, graduate last week of business analytics. That's also interesting. Congratulations. <laughs> Still a student. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, we, we have some project managers here. So it seems that somebody doesn't find the link. Interesting. Somebody's writing it. 
We have someone nowhere close to graduating. <laughs> nice. So, so we have software architectures and students. That's that's always good. <laughs> interesting, interesting. I guess you invited the right people. Sure. <laughs> Seems so. Yeah. So nice, nice. So uh, in the case we have software architecture and students, we should keep the discussions always on a good, good step so we don't get too focused on technology stuff. <laughs> good, maybe we, we start also with the, the next question or should we just wait a couple of minutes now? But I think it's, it's, it will, will be fine. Yeah, I think we'll be fine. Let's, let's head over to the first question. Sure, sure. So, um, but before we actually start with the first question to the audience, also an interesting topic would be uh, what kind of big data technologies or tools do you know, actually? So for instance, uh, Spark, Flink, or something like that. Please also write it into maybe this will be a discussion point later on. Ooh, Hadoop, Spark, Kafka. Oh, that's the good people. <laughs> <laughs> At least they didn't pick up what you just said. <laughs> uh, just, just one thing. Can can uh, the audience add more than one word? Or sure, sure, you just... can just okay. normally you can put a lot of things to it. So MATLAB, AI, so machine ma learning, interesting too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's also you quite interesting. It works. <laughs> but it's but it's in quotes. So it can mean anything. Ooh. So we'll talk it's about so... the elephant today, maybe. <laughs> yeah. it's, about it's, also, it's also quite interesting that we are already in some sort of hybrid cloud environment with RME on uh, kinesis. Sure, yeah. Interesting. Maybe some Azure people out there as well. Oh, scoop pick hive. <laughs> That's also nice. So, so. Oh, it's interesting blockchain, but it does not mention some concrete technologies. <laughs> Just post something more like AI. <laughs> So my squirrel, squirrel cutie. Someone wrote Squirtle and I am like 90% sure that's a Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, we there's are. actually a no. funny uh, app where you can just uh, guess the names. Is it a big data application or a Pokemon? I think we, yeah. we played it last time. <laughs> Only a Pokemon for for sure. all non-English viewers. That's um, Shiggy, like the the starter water Pokemon. The the funny part was also about Impala because it, it could be a Pokemon, but if you know it, it's it's just a framer. Uh, it's our tool actually. It it could also be a real animal. <laughs> sure, it could also be a real animal. I mean, it is actually. Yeah. <laughs> so um. Huli, Spark, so we have a lot of people who are using MongoDB, Hadoop, yeah, of course. Kafka, it's interesting, yeah. So some people do know about distributed systems. Spark as well, that's always fun. I like Spark too, if somebody asks. <laughs> and yeah, cool. Uh, during this talk, if you have any questions about big data you always want to ask, please just enter in the comment section and we will post them in the view. Ah like this. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. Um, so let's start with our first question we have prepared. Actually, I think that would be a good idea. I let the slider maybe open so people can just uh, add something to it. Um, so the first question is uh, at which size or which data size starts big data for you? 
Uh, maybe let's start with Bernhard. Yeah, well, I mean, so it's it's a quite interesting uh, uh, question, actually, especially for Austria, since we are, I would say, always some sort of small data. But it, you know, of course, depends. So traditionally, you uh, classify them by the uh, four Vs. But it depends, of course, on the use case. Um, the quite generic answer is, yeah, everything that is too big for your hard disk. However, I would say so, um, to provide a more general, uh, generally and abstract uh, uh, gut feeling from my side, I would say at least uh, some sort of terabytes. Uh, especially since streaming uh, or IoT can add here, or we can reach here also some, I would say, new areas or hemispheres of, of the amount of data uh, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting opinion, yeah. But do you think that uh, something like Hadoop can also have an interesting point in smaller data, or is just only the environment for this amount of data? Uh, well, Hadoop itself is uh, some sort of environment, as you already correctly um, proposed. Um, it, of course, depends what you actually want to do with such environment. Uh, if you, uh, for example, store uh, also some small amounts of uh, uh, data into a classical database, of course, you would drop here the analytical uh, capabilities uh, that such environment can uh, add to uh, your architecture in that sense. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Thank you. Um, Peter. Yeah, so um, I, I can just uh, more or less agree to, to what Bernard said, but maybe maybe add a little bit that so I have the feeling that um, currently the the meaning of big data also changed a little bit. So previously, a couple of years ago, big data was just about processing because you, you had always the problem you have two big amounts of, of data you know what you want to do and you just need some some fancy tool to processing it and i think we're shifting now if we now talk about big data it's like you you shift your view of of the problem because you have the, the classical development there your data is like the the commodity and the thing you have to deal in in the back end that your system is working and you you you're more or less um, don't want to have to do anything with your data except using it. And as soon as you talk about big data, it's not anymore that much about the actual size, but more you, you're starting with, with the data and building, building up, up from there. So you're, you're gathering your data, doesn't matter if it's big or small, and then you, you gather your tools and start processing your data and looking at it and building use cases starting with the data and not the other way around. Yeah, sure, sure. So it's uh, big data is all about also data science, I think, because if you have the amount of data, you can do everything you want with it. Yeah, and that's actually the point of it. Yeah, mm, that's also, right. Yeah, like like the processing, you're, you're you're trying to see what you can do if you if you apply like stream processing to some of your your sources and and all this stuff. You're you're really trying to pull more value out of your data and not. Um, sure, sure. A nice front end, and then there is some data in the end, of course. But yeah, yeah, of course, of course, it's a use case driven uh, thinking. Yeah, that, that that's actually a good part. But I think always the problem is to c compare a big data engineer or actually the whole data engineering with the whole data science aspect because we are all about scaling and so on. And mm -hmm. if you're asking a data scientist, they're using tools like R, for instance, uh, where they can really scale i think so maybe i'm i have a wrong opinion about it but maybe you have another idea about this maybe stefan you could <laughs> take that ah, great stefan. <laughs> um so i i think uh, before i answer the question um hmm? i want to clarify some misconceptions uh because uh Big data and and Hadoop just right now have been used uh, synonym synonymously, and I think uh, I mean Hadoop was always associated with big data in the past. But uh, we are talking about the Hadoop ecosystem, all the tools that are, um, that were created around this to to help uh, deal with the problem that is big data. Um, but now it's not just Hadoop, it's, it's really a lot of tools um, to do stream processing, uh, to do 
any kind of uh, basically to do any kind of processing that you can't handle with traditional tools anymore. Uh, let's say if you have structured data and if you uh, can do it with a very beefy machine uh, and, and if you can store it and uh, write it and read it from a relational database management system, then you probably don't need uh, any of the tools in the Hadoop ecosystem. Um, if you have uh, pictures, uh, if you want to uh, do some text analysis, um, and if if uh, the the number of events that come in uh, or that or that need to be processed is very high, uh, then uh, it doesn't matter if it's uh, one terabyte or one petabyte. Uh, you probably want some tools that are reliable, scalable, and available to to do the job. Hmm. Mm, good opinion. Yeah. Um, we have currently a question of uh, community. Let me let me show you to it from Toby123. In my experience, a huge part of big data is actually just formatting and extracting the data to a useful format. How do you think will this part of data science change be optimized in the future? So, who wants to uh, start with answering? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I will start to, or I will pick it up. Um, yeah, you're right that what you actually mentioned here, it's uh, the classical data engineering uh, side of big data in terms of that you process data, that you extract it, and to, uh, that you schematize it at some point. Um, how do we think we, the data science will influence that? Um, at least uh, there are also now popping up some projects that do automatically some uh, optimization in terms that they uh, make an educated guess on the formatting of that, that try to automatically extract some entities, if I think in terms of NLP, and they try to uh, make implicit knowledge, as the academia world always says, more explicit than it's and now within the data or that is encapsulated within. Mm -hmm. Good. Any other opinions? So, yeah, so, so I think so if, if you think about where, where, well, where are the boundaries, so I don't think that AI or, 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 or the machine learning will ever um, take away all the, the formatting in the, in the um, like, um, like the data model stuff because there is a huge chunk of actually business knowledge so if you if you think about the the classical data warehouse housing stuff where we try to push all the the technical formats into a business readable format if if you look at these mappings there is a huge amount of business knowledge which you just can't derive from from the data itself so you get two fields that look exactly the same but they have totally different business meanings and i think that you will never be able to resolve with machine learning because you you, you need just the extra the extra knowledge for that so that will probably be always um, a, 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 at least partially manual task of course there will be a lot of help coming from there and on the other hand, also probably the data scientists. Um, if you if you look on on the the model development, um, they need as a, as a starting point already a quite good data model to derive all their um, all their different attributes to to base um, good data models on there. So I think. It's it's more the other way around that the better your your entities are and the, the more structured or yeah the, the more the more um, business insights you have into your data the better your data um, the, the the machine learning models will be afterwards. Stefan, we have also uh, something to say about it or. I, I think I understood the question in a slightly different way. I, I think the, the question was, maybe I am wrong, but uh, I will never know probably. Um, but uh, 
the question I think was more like that big data is more like the term for the extraction and pre-processing. And mm -hmm. then uh, the assumption is that after the pre-processing, at least that's how, how I read it, um, after the pre-processing and extraction, the data is not that big anymore and you don't need all these distributed systems. I, I hope that is uh, what the intention of the question was. And I think it's wrong. <laughs> uh, if that was the intention of the question, um, in the end, even if, when you build your model, when you deploy your model, when uh, if you're talking about the advanced uh, applications of machine learning, uh, building, deploying a model, using the model, you, you still need to be able to cope with um, high amounts of data, possibly. Maybe uh, if you um, if you condense uh, and extract and manipulate and aggregate your data, of course, uh, it might not be that uh, much anymore. And you might not be able to uh, talk about big data anymore. Uh, but it could still be. If you have petabytes of data uh, in the source and you uh, still have um, a, few, uh, a few less petabytes, um, then you still need uh, technologies that, that scale well. And yeah. then you would still be talking about big data. I hope yeah. that was the correct interpretation of the question. Yeah. And, and also, if you see it like this, it's, it's exactly correct. So, of course, when developing a, a model, you, you, you or, or for models, usually you have to to calculate averages and sum up stuff on, on, a, on a certain level. And these are very, very expensive um, operations to do on, on big data. And for that, you need to, 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 to run these models on a regular basis. You just need a powerful machine or a big data processing um, environment. Cool, yeah. And, uh, that's a lot of good questions, uh, good answers. <laughs> So, uh, ah, seems some uh, next question actually. So, what are the steps uh, by microwave zero <laughs> seven? Uh, what are the steps to be followed to deploy a big data solution? Uh, no, no. Uh, first, the question to <laughs> me: What what are you microwaving actually? Good <laughs> <laughs> hmm, oh, question. <laughs> um, I, I mean, uh, that's uh, just if I want to answer this, this is something um, we are answering every day with our customers at Cloudera in the professional services team. But um, it's just too much to talk about this right now. Uh, you always need to design, plan, and as Peter said, what's the use case? Um, why can't I solve this with um, with the tools that I already have? and and then you go ahead and choose the the right uh, the platform, the right solution um, from uh, from the stack, um, and and do the implementation in whatever way you um, want to be doing this. If it's only about the deployment of uh, already ready solution, um, uh, that depends on which framework you're using and which tool set you're using. So it's very specific. Uh, but uh, happy to answer this in more detail in another session or privately with more input. Cool. I th what okay. I'm currently questioning myself, what is in these terms a big data solution? So it's for me a little bit too generic. Because on the one hand, we have the classical engineering, I would say, um, area. And that's, uh, I would propose here to follow the typically approaches, which means that you have your uh, lab environment that you code your stuff, and that at some point you ship it towards a traditional engineering pipeline uh, uh, on the cluster. On the other hand, we are having here the uh, science uh, related area, where of course this is somehow uh, changing tremendously. Um, of course, you have here utility programs that uh, run or actually execute a model. However, it's here then slightly different if you have to upgrade a model, because that can be as easy as just changing a um, line in the database, or it's more uh, broader in terms of uh, redeploying a microservice. Also, it depends heavily if you want to go into cloud or deploy it locally. So if, if you are yeah, sure. some kind of cloud environment, it's, it 
depends on your use case, but can be as easy as uh, going to to Azure and doing a couple of couple of clicks, or probably calling up or, or going to the Cloudera homepage and doing a couple of clicks there, and you have a you have a ready to go environment that can handle most data sizes without any uh, without a lot of detailed configuration. Of course, if you go to very very large data sets. Um, even there, you have to to watch out. But yeah, just in, instead of making the tech stack, um, choosing if you go on uh, do it on premise or in the cloud, uh, you should figure out uh, if you want to do it on premise or in the cloud based on a lot of other factors. Um, there's some uh, a lot of advantages to cloud, and there's also some advantages to on premises deployment. But I think there um, the, the the point is it shouldn't depend on which which kind of software and tools you should be using um, to choose whether to go on premises or or yeah. deploy to the cloud. Usually, it depends a lot of where your data comes from, right? So if you have a lot of up and down streams from a, a local entity anywhere to the cloud and back again, all of a sudden the the cloud doesn't look as um, promising anymore. But if everything is already in the cloud, exactly. And yeah, I mean, and other and a lot of other factors. Yeah, that's that's a good point that uh, Stefan made here. Um, well, of course, the uh, proposed or at least chosen solution should be independent of uh, the of your programming style. So it, at the end, it should uh, it does not matter if you're using, for example, Python, R, or Java ish. Uh, it has to be uni uniform in that way, which means uh, you can put anything into it. Even if you're funny, you can use, for example, Prolog uh, onto Big Data. That uh, yeah, well, that works uh, also quite well. Uh, however, you cannot use it in the traditional Java-ish style. But that's in terms of uh, deploying a Big Data solution uh, should be abstracted in some sort of. Cool. Cool. So let's Rafi. step maybe. Yeah, uh, sure. I, I see we have a lot of questions yeah, yeah. in the in the um, in chat. So I'll, I'll write them down, um, and I say we keep them for later. I'll mark them as as yet to be answered. Um, mm -hmm. Is that all right with all of you? Yeah, sure. Let's uh, let's uh, first step to the next uh, big question, yeah. and then let's focus on the community questions. You're right. So um, to the next question. Uh, quite a simple question, but maybe a good question to discuss. Uh, what does big data engineer, a big data engineer, need in his tool belt? So, what are your actually your daily tools, or what maybe are frameworks or tool or something like that you could be actually prefer? Or, I don't know. So, uh, let's start maybe with Stefan this time. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, my answer is probably a little bit boring. Uh, because it fits to any kind of IT and engineering role. Um, in the end, uh, you need uh, people who are motivated, accept the change that software is is always uh, uh, pressing uh, pressing on us. Uh, we need to be able to learn new things constantly. Um, and the most important thing is actually not which tools you have in your belt, but um, how well you understand the big picture and the concepts behind it, and then having the ability to also dive down and learn the tool that is required to solve your problem, um, maybe master it and be ready to forget it in one or two years because there's a better tool out there to solve the same problem. That's actually a good, good thing. Maybe this will also answer the next question. <laughs> so uh, Peter, what's your opinion about this topic? Yeah, so well, probably um, the answer is you, you you shouldn't have like a fixed tool belt um, because all the all the tools that are even out there, so that there is no um, Swiss Army knife that fits like ninety percent of the of the problems. It's all very highly highly specialized tools, and you you have you have to start with your use case and see what you need. And then you have to assess um, what it, what is out there. And I think if you if you put together a, a tool belt for yourself, you're just 
limiting you, your your capabilities um, because probably if you try to to fit, for example, if you if you want to do stream processing in Hive, you you won't get anywhere. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right, actually. Yeah. In the, in the other way around, if you want to do um, big batch processing in in like like Kafka or so, um, probably also not not really the the best tool for it. Um, so you, you just have to be open minded. Of course, it doesn't hurt hurt if you like know the the big players like um, the Hadoop stack or or, Cla or Cladera or um, maybe some kind of um, couple of multi-purpose ETL tools, which you can use for for less higher loads because there there's always like um, next to the the big big heavy hitters in your in your big data environments, you always need smaller tables, other data sources, metadata stuff like that. So it doesn't hurt to have like this multi-purpose ETL tool where you're very familiar in. Yeah, and other than this, just open mind and try to pick the best tool for your your, your use case. Yeah, sure. I think this also, if you look uh, again at this this uh, word chart, you see also that somebody has said uh, he's using Scoop Pick, uh, the old stuff. So it's actually not the old stuff. It's just a, a tool that you can use. And the benefit to, to change to another tool is always depending on your use case. That's actually Also, the, if you look at, at Hadoop, the biggest um, thing in the word chart, it's not one tool, right? So yeah, sure. It's an, it's an environment, yeah. Yeah. With with a lot of multi, with a lot of very specialized databases and and tools in there. Yeah, of course, of course. So we can just specify one tool. That's why we have so many, because yeah. on the one hand you have Impala, on the other hand you have Hive. Both are SQL interfaces. I think there are also some more out there. So you can't really specify on the thing you need, because some some cases this one is better than the other one. In case of Hive and Impala, there are some main differences. But I think there's also a third new new. SQL interface where you can provide the uh, SQL interface, which is um, so, uh, so, which is, are supporting an SQL standard, of course, which Hive and uh, Impala doesn't really do. So it's, I think you you have both a right opinion about it. I'm I'm actually I agree with both of your opinions. Um, but Bernhard, Bernhard, what's your opinion about this topic? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean the points that have already been provided are quite valid. Um, let's recap that from a 10,000 miles point of view. I mean, as as it has already been said, uh, it does not make sense that you keep uh, your stick to one tool or for one specific purpose. Of course, it depends uh, uh, for some uh, other constraints, and these other constraints are the more interesting one. For example, me as an architecture, I want to have a tool that has uh, at, least, at least in the battlefield at least for the next five to ten years. Um, for that one is the focus, for example, uh, also always the also so-called well-established tools, for example, Spark and Hive. Uh, however, um, you also should try to uh, grab the concepts behind because they are will not change, also um, not in the near or long-term future. I mean, it's also somehow related to how long are we shipping data from A to B. I mean, we are doing this basically since the 80s. And since then, we are also, I mean, the techno, uh, technological capabilities have changed tremendously, that's for sure. But uh, we will also uh, still need some sort of batch pro processing in the next 100 years because that's quite crucial and, and essential. And uh, at some point, you should not care if it's called Spark or Flink. Uh, I mean, uh, they're at, uh, working uh, uh, more or less similar from that 10,000 mile uh, perspective. Um, yeah, the, at that point, it's know your audience and know them quite well. Uh, so uh, 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 one company is different to another one. I would uh, uh, start this argumentation from this perspective. And if, for example, company A wants to prefer Flink, yeah, OK, then it's Flink. Then you're more uh, scoped towards this uh, stream processing stuff. And if, for example, if a company prefers Spark, then it's more uh, on the traditional uh, Hadoop and big data point of view, and you're uh, more or less on this micro-patching uh, architecture. 
especially if you're on the international uh, uh, area of big data, then you would not have both of them. Then you would start also building native stream applications without Spark and Flink. Cool, cool, yeah. I, I think we, we all agree here, basically. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to add that if I had to recommend one tool, then it would be Apache NiFi. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, uh, I think that's the only true answer to this question. So, well, um, yeah, as I said, it depends on <laughs> of some sort of views. <laughs> Uh, if I would have a highly critical business uh, process, and process does not necessarily mean software, then I probably would also not think about knife But that's just my humble opinion here. <laughs> I, I, I was, uh, I was not hundred percent serious. The the other Stefan that would be in uh, in this. Uh, uh, live stream uh, was actually a talent expert. <laughs> so maybe he has another opinion about the topic. <laughs> but let's see, maybe he will join a bit later. So maybe uh, let's uh, start with a new commu uh, community question here. So in, uh, from Koji Im1, in terms of real-time processing, how many entries per second does it take to call it big data? So who wants uh, to pick up first? Balance. Yeah, that's <laughs> also somehow related to where, what is the, uh, when do we start to talk about big data? I think it depends on, I mean, also real time is quite elastic at that point. I mean, especially in Vienna Linen, we have real time that is uh, updating it uh, once per week. But also we have some uh, real time cases that call real time in terms of sub seconds. And I think this question aims at here at more or less on the sub-second uh, scenario where I would call uh, real-time, it, it is at least, I would say, 100,000 uh, records, but one to one million per second, which uh, uh, indicates, of course, some latency problems, which at least stress your network a little bit. But as I said, it's also somehow when does big data start here in our question. Yeah. Because so, if, we, if we also, yeah. please, please. I also think it, it highly depends on on the load that you're putting on the data or what you want to do with it. Because I also know from projects um, which which are doing actually entity recognition in in PDFs, um, which they want to um, like like relay to to the caller, um, looking like it's real time, and of course they 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 still have similar uh, problems to 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 big data or to the classical thing that that you're talking about and they're using the exactly the same tools they're using kafka they're they're um they're using using docker containers to spin up and spin down and scale all the stuff but just all the machine learning processes behind it are so heavy that they can't handle more than a couple of requests a second and it, it's still like the same process, uh, the same problems that they have, and the same tools and solutions they they, they utilize. So it's it's a little bit depending on what you do really with the data stream, and then how how what what you can <laughs> what you can allow yourself to handle the load. <laughs> yeah. And also yeah. How it yeah, I mean, I, I would also have this question uh, and another one. So the, the first question would be, what do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? Uh, what do you, uh, what are your requirements on the latency? Um, how many events do you actually need to process? Does it really make sense to process uh, or to have a pipeline that can process hundred thousands of events per second? Um, or are you fine with uh, just a few events? Um, even though there, there are 100,000 events per second, you might not have the need to immediately process all of them. So that, that would be one. And the second would be, what what is an entry? Um, is it a one terabyte uh, file of something? Then I'd say a few, a few entries per second is already a lot. If it's uh, just a, a, a very small message with a, a small payload, and you can go up to a, a lot of uh, events. Uh, and that depends, of course, as I said, also on the requirements. 
Yeah. Cool. Also, in the end, so it's, it's it not really fits to the to the, to the title of, of the talk, but in the end, it also doesn't matter if you call it big data pros, big data or not big data. So you have a stream processing problem, and you, independent of what you call it, in the end, you have to look at the tools which are usually found in the big data tool stack, and see if it fits to your problem. And if it's just yeah. one request per second, if if the the tool solves the problem it's okay i mean to abstract it here a little bit from the technical question at least you always want to solve a business problem because that's the justification of of at least your department of and of your uh, business unit if you just say okay i want to process for example log files but there is no decent business case around that then it will be hard to grab any money and to be honest at least uh we always want to get uh, paid at least some sort of um and uh before you uh, start questioning uh, uh, what sort of uh, um, uh, what latency i want to achieve is the, the proper question would be uh what sort of SLAs uh, uh, do I have to achieve for solving this certain business pro business problem? And this is a pure non-technical question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'd say we um, answer this question from Keith Parker um, first, and then we move on. Sure. To um, to the next big topic, but, but before we uh, go into the question, a uh, big welcome for Stefan. <laughs> nice to got here. Nice to have you here. So and now maybe this yeah, is something for you now. Yeah, of course we can hear you. So uh, maybe this this is your first question actually. So uh, question from Cheese Burger. Maybe it's a cheese burger with. <laughs> Something else. Um, it's yeah, it's something. Uh, it's burger. Burger. It's yeah, cheese true. Burger. <laughs> true. True. Yeah. So, uh, what was the hardest issue in implementation you had to resolve, Stefan? So, oh, it's a good thing now. We have two Stefans now. The new one. <laughs> the new, <laughs> the new <laughs> Stefan. Or the late. The late Stefan. <laughs> the, the, the late Stefan. <laughs> yeah, so, I say that part with the late new Stefan. <laughs> Both. So what was the hardest issue in implementation you have to resolve? Okay, that's a very hard question. I, 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 have, to, <laughs> I, I have to tell you. Stefan, um, it's, a, it's a job interview. You... <laughs> ah, okay, okay. <laughs> so I was wondering <laughs> what, what is happening here? <laughs> The hardest job of implementation. I, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I went um, maybe um, looking uh, at, at, at my career um, and, and working, having worked for a software vendor as well uh, back a uh, couple of years. Um, I think um, more or less the hardest thing was um, to deliver um, solutions in in a very short uh, amount of time, maybe only a couple of days or a week, and um, most of the times it 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 have been firefighter uh, engagements. Yeah? People are running into problems and and then um, yeah uh, fiddling around a little bit and um, then trying even harder for a couple of weeks and months. And then if it's not working, even then, yeah, then, then they call for the vendor and, and, and ask for help. And yeah, you can imagine, then the situation is already quite um, severe. Um, I think some of these situations, yeah, um, you, you come to the client and, and he's telling you, um, yeah, okay, your software, that, that's not working at all. Yeah, it's completely slow. And um, yeah, and um, I think uh, that was always a challenge. And it was always nice uh, to come up with a solution maybe um, in, in, in two or three days, um, solving problems they, they couldn't solve in a couple of months. Um, on the one side, maybe some some blushing was uh, involved on the other side as well. Um, but yeah, I, I have imagined uh, always um, 
uh, people tend a little bit to say, okay, um, the, the tool uh, is, is not delivering or is not working or has a bug or is not quick enough instead of, in the end of the day, I do not know it really. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, but uh, that, I think that's, that's quite human. Yeah? No one would ever say that. Um, it's, it's always easier to blame the tool. And, um, yeah, I, I think um, I traveled around uh, all around Europe for Informatica. I hope I can, I can name that here. Um, uh, and I think so the hardest thing was maybe sometimes the, the extensive traveling, um, sometimes during the week. Yeah, um, going from, from, from Germany in the beginning of the week to Switzerland and in the middle of the week to, to Turkey and, and, and going there to some very remote part uh, of Turkey um, and, 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 and doing there a, a uh, yeah, very specific job uh, and, and solve the problem. Um, so I think the, the, the combination... Um, uh, was it? I, I couldn't say I have some f uh, some some topic uh, in in a sense be because um, yeah, there's always a way a, a way to 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 solve problems. Especially, I, I did a lot of performance tuning. I don't know. Do I have a time limit? Um, <laughs> um. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> I just want to, to click at the time no. button. But. No, no, I have. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, I think in the end we, we, we found um, uh, always a solution. I think um, if you stick to a step-by-step -step approach yeah, and, and uh, try to, to focus where's the problem, you you can solve um, even even difficult uh, uh, things and a lot of things were difficult because as I mentioned yeah um, we were called um, mostly when when the building was already burned down completely yeah um, so yeah then then it's very hard to 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 save uh, something but we did it That's we we got uh, rescued the whole uh, building yeah. Even it was already burned down. <laughs> <laughs> That's always good, yeah. So uh, let me step right into and start with a new uh, main question. So, uh, which criteria do you use to determine if a tool or a technology is mature enough to include into your toolkit? Actually, maybe let's start with Peter uh, this time. So, what do you think when a when is a technology or a tool mature enough to use it in a production use case? I think it depends heavily. So, so because even in product production use cases, um, they, they are not all shaped equally, right? So um, I would um, depend heavily on what are the implications of the use case and actually what happens if the if, if the use case fails. So that's that's always where the question you have to to think about what's um, what's the worst case scenario? And not only from a tool reliability point of view, but also what you what you have to look at if you so if you if you're not um, going in the direction of of open source, but but even there, um, what happens if tomorrow your tool is like outdated? Nobody cares about it, and the company that's um, supporting it is is um, not there anymore or gets bought by somebody else. And it's just not supported anymore. So at least for open source tools, you have um, like like a little. The, the good thing is, worst case, you can take the source code and develop it yourself. You have a lot of lot of issues there. Um, but let's say for everything, for every use case, you just can't afford that um, that it's it's shutting down or it's tomorrow not working anymore. I would only rely on on like um, technologies that um, have proven to be to be viable in in let, let's say similar environments, and that I know that big companies already use it. So that I think then, if if you know that that a couple of big companies are, are actively using it, you're at least at some point on a safe side that um, for your big use case. 
um, you you can't do anything wrong with it. Um, usually, you, you don't have the comfort for, for the new tools um, for that. Um, yeah, it's sure, sure, yeah. Uh, it, it's always it's always a little bit. So if you just have that central tool, and if that fails, um, you're done, and you have to start over. You should be a lot careful, a lot more careful than if it's some kind of tool that maybe uh, does some some side processing or or can be switched out by something more standard in a matter of of days or weeks. Then I think you can be more general or, or more generous when it comes to to your requirements. Um, yeah. So so there is there is not um, let, let's say in my opinion, not that definite answer, but like we like we had a lot, lot right now. It, it always depends on the use case you have. Um, but I think for the most important use case, you should just um, look look around. So usually you can find um, very easily if the tool is already used in, in bigger use cases or not. Look at the supporters. And if you recognize the names, then you're probably on the safe side for your critical workloads. Sure. The, the thing is, I, I had this issue one time, but not in the big data environment, just in the JavaScript environment, because there are popping so many frameworks every time. Every, maybe for every week, you have another framework. And this issue is pretty common there that you see that a uh, framework was hyped uh, a month, and then yeah. it, it drops, actually. And so what do you do if you have implemented in your in your company structure? It, yeah. But but in the you, end, it all, it all comes down, more or less, not to to take the decision if you use it or not, but to to prepare for the worst case scenario. So what do you do if Perfect. it happens? Cool. So any other opinions about this topic or about this question actually? Yeah, I mean <laughs> uh, one one point that is here quite interesting is if you look from a security perspective at your tool or technology that might be a good indicator. So if your tool does not support security or even legal, then this is like a strong indicator that it's not mature that you should include it in your uh, toolkit. Yeah. Cool, cool. So uh, does somebody else has an opinion about this topic or should we move maybe to a community question? Well, uh, I, I completely agree with, with Peter actually. Um, and it's kind of an easy question for me um, if in terms of uh, implementing or, or choosing uh, the right tools to implement because um, we at Cladera have like 3,000 people dedicated to, to choose uh, what we can uh, support for our customers. Uh, we want to build the enterprise data platform uh, to cover the entire data lifecycle from uh, data ingest, data engineering, data warehousing, operational database, and machine learning, um, completely enterprise ready and secure. So uh, I trust that whatever the 3,000 people behind Cloudera um, are supporting in the open source world uh, is enterprise ready. Cool, cool. But uh, do you have um, a kind of a roadmap to, to implement something in the Cloudera step? or in the, in the short term to explain it maybe? Or when do you get from, oh, this project could be interesting, it's on the tech radar, and then, yeah, we need this in our Cloudera manager to get it up and running. I mean, so how, that's, how, what, that's what our product management and our engineering does. Mm -hmm. um, uh, basically, we, are, we have the contributors um, in, in those open source project, um, and we try to support uh, the, the, the those open source project, we actively develop them, and we make sure that uh, that what we support is um, at least um, enterprise ready for uh, a modern IT for a certain amount of time. And if uh, it, if it's uh, evident that there is a better tool to do the same job or another tool uh, that is more efficient, cheaper, whatever, um, then um, of course there's some um, uh, end of support, uh, and then this is something we communicate to our customers. Look, in one year we uh, or we already ha we had that. For example, with Flume, uh, Apache Flume um, is not supported anymore in, in CDP and in, in Cloudera data platform. 
because it was replaced by Apache NiFi. And um, we communicated that a very, very long time ago and uh, helped our customers uh, from, uh, from an engineering point of view and also from a services point of view to overcome this challenge of um, adapting uh, and getting used to new technology that is more efficient and brings more value to the business in the end. Cool, cool. Mm -hmm. So also so, maybe one thing to, to add to that, the, the, like the, the problem here is like really more severe than just choosing the new tool. Most of the time, the, the, the even worse um, thing is to choose that um, fancy new beta version of even a proven tool that has some kind of fancy new um, thing in there that you really need. But all the other <laughs> stuff that's in the beta version is probably a lot more buggy than, than the normal thing. So that's also one thing to always watch out. New versions. It's very, out. very good aspect, yeah. Don't, don't always go for the shiny things. Yeah. <laughs> They always look nice, but then <laughs> isn't called beta yeah. for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. Uh, so no beta with beta. <laughs> <laughs> not, not for production. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. And also so, starts with, with zero point, probably, <laughs> probably not a good thing if you don't ha really have to use it. Yeah, but but the, the thing is. Even so, so even I, I know uh, I think I can remember when we did our first uh, Hadoop stack, there were actually some versions with zero point something, but it, it's just always asking the question, what do you do if it fails? So so in case of in case of a Hadoop cluster, um, if you want to use some so, something really um, that's um, that's not standard or or in in some kind of new versions. You have to get um, a good support or somebody who, who can support you in solving that issues. So for example, when we did our initial implementation, we, for a reason, didn't do the open source thing, but choose the Hortonworks support where we had a big company who we knew if we have issues with that stuff, we can call them up. So it's just mm -hmm. all about risk management in the end. Yeah, cool, cool. So uh, maybe now another community question from Maria Nom. Which, uh, for which data is Elasticsearch used? Uh, do anybody use this technology? Maybe has somebody experience with Elasticsearch in this round? I, I, I can answer. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, it basically, it's, a, it's an uh, indexing uh, engine. Uh, Elasticsearch is based on Apache uh, Lucene an uh, indexing engine and Elasticsearch is a search engine on top of this indexing engine. And the use cases are whenever you want to uh, do some search of uh, basically anything that you can index to create um, real-time applications, uh, dashboards, uh, or just a, a very basic search engine um, has lots of features. And uh, a very related technology is Apache Solar. Uh, it's basically another, Search engine on top of Elastic, uh, on top of Apache Lucene, uh, very similar to Elasticsearch. So, so I think actually a lot of these free text searches on big data is is done with this because if you put sure. you execute this queries, you will wait forever. <laughs> I I always I always think interesting of what uh, certain technologies are not, and Elasticsearch is certainly not uh, a long term storage um, okay. or storage of uh, or a reliable long-term storage um, because it's uh, I mean one of the reasons is it also uh, costs a lot of resources uh, to keep all of those documents uh, in memory indexed uh, which is on the one hand uh, yeah, bad because it costs a lot of resources but uh, then gives you the performance that you need to quickly retrieve the documents that you're searching for cool cool yeah, um, maybe let's move on to the, the next community questions. It what, what, seems what, like. Oh, well, while I, I have you there, um, a community question from me. 
Um, <laughs> what makes a data store a reliable data store? Like, what what are your um, specifications um, to certify a data store with, with the brand of reliable? Who's taking it's that? <laughs> yeah, okay. I will jump in the fire as usual. <laughs> um, uh, in term terms, what means reliable? It also comes in different dimensions. If reliable means if I store something and get out of that, then of course um, it can be any append only data store, like for example, HDFS. But I think that's not the aim of the question. I mean, at the end, you want to at least retrieve data, apply a schema on top of that, and extract some, uh, I would call it, uh, knowledge or information in the best case. Um, that, of course, uh, then uh, probably HDFS is not the appropriate storage because then it uh, always re results in some sort of data graveyard. Um, it's also reliable, could be also mean in the terms that uh, um, I want to access it quite fast. And of course, uh, HBase might be a proper fit for this question. Um, so I personally think uh, reliable in that terms is at least defined from my perspective. Uh, the data storage provides uh, an information at that point where I need it. And, um, this comes again in different dimensions, and of course, um, different tools that are address this uh, uh, question differently. Yeah, I also so so I also think there are like three dimensions that come right away in, in into my mind. The first thing is it so how is the data stored? Is it stored reliably? So is it distributed somehow? Um, this I can usually. Uh, work around with all the with all the databases because if I not pick something like like a distributed data store which has that built in, I can always do backups and stuff like this. So I can solve this one. The next thing that that I um, can't solve uh, that that quite easily, I really have to pick probably the 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 right database for it. Um, is it reliable in terms of performance? So. What are my usual usual loads, and can the database handle this kind of loads? And then there's the, the third dimension. It's like the transactional um, certainty. So if I need some some um, transactions which span over multiple tables or so on, so that's just a feature of the database. Either it has it and it supports it, or it doesn't. Yeah, yeah I completely agree. I'd more maybe generalize this even. Uh, saying reliable is uh, basically fulfilling the use case requirements in a certain percentage, um, which should be high amount of time. Yeah, like I, I want that my use case requirements are fulfilled in 99% of uh, all cases, or even further, 99.999, and, and so on. Uh, so, Stefan, maybe a comment for you. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, GT. R R A A R Elasticsearch is a distributed data store with replicas. Point by point, I think there is a little more reliable than that. Do you agree? Yeah, there's there's little more uh, there's little more reliable than that. Um, yeah, um, in, in the end, as I said, it depends uh, on the on the use case what you want to achieve with this. And certainly, you don't want to uh, you don't want to store data forever in Elasticsearch. And, yeah. I mean, like what the you... name suggests, it's very specialized for one action to do. So, so you, so if you want to sum up rows in Elasticsearch, you won't be really happy. You can search data in there. So. Um, of, of course, it's, sure, it's reliable yeah. in, in one dimension that your data isn't getting lost. So that's the distributed stuff. But when mm -hmm. it comes to different, th there is there's like Elasticsearch, there's no transactional security in, uh, as far as I know. Uh, yeah, but, in, a, in, a way, in a way, you can always find uh, uh, that any kind of technology is not reliable in fulfilling something. Yeah, yeah. sure, sure. But that's that's also what I wanted to say. Yeah. yeah so, so for example, so I can actually give an uh, example where Elasticsearch is used, if uh, because it was also in the in the previous 
um, in the previous question. So um, there is um, one, um, for, for example, there, there is in, in, in the back end, there is one big, uh, big part of, of banking back end is payments processing. And there is one um, system you can actually go there and buy it. It's called um, GPP by Funtech. And it's structured in a way that actually there's a big distributed Oracle database in, in, in the bottom where they store all the all their transactions. So it's really payments. So, so moving money from one account to another. And that's, of course, for each bank, that's like the, the biggest chunk of data. And on top on that, so for the business users, um, so they can have a free text search within this big data pool. They um, put it all also into Elasticsearch that they can make it searchable. But all the processing is done on the classic database, and only the, the search for the, the front end is done in Elasticsearch. For example, a counter use case for that would be a real time search in indexing for that, of course, uh, elastic search. Uh, let's say, let's say it like that has it difficulties. Yeah, because you have sure, to sure. put data in there. <laughs> so uh, maybe a question of a fan of mine. It looks like that. <laughs> it's actually not me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, our common visualization methods such as line point charts, histograms, etc., still used when dealing with huge data sizes or are there different visualizations for that case? Hmm. Always depends on what you want to show, right? <laughs> sure, yeah, I mean. So you, you, don't go, you don't go and just visualize data because you like to look at data. If you're just developing, you're, you're not visualizing data at all, you're 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 calculating your KPIs and and probably not doing any kind of charts, but um, maybe some some insights of our uh, diploma thesis with our uh, HDL students. Uh, they're currently uh, working on a um, digital twin concept for this whole gathering of data and so on over the city of Vienna, and uh, maybe a visualization thing for this where we're just a 3D simulation where you can have multiple buildings with multiple data sets and you can zoom in if you want to. Maybe this is another approach instead of a diagram for visualization of big data. But I think classic charts are always yeah. there. I, so. I personally like this question simply because it uh, shifts towards to the business in the BI domain. Yeah. I mean, um, first of all, as has already been said, it depends what you want to show. And of course, at some point, there are always two things that you can do. Either you filter out uh, the things that you do not want to see, which means that you reduce the amount of data, or you abstract them, which means that you do some sort of uh, rolling up in terms of BI terms. Uh, and then you just uh, go in the direction of, I would say, dashboarding. Um, that's also commonly done here in this uh, question, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, but I'd say uh, an histogram is already uh, a way to deal with uh, big amounts of data, bigger amounts of data. It's, it's just counting. Uh, and a count is nothing else uh, as an aggregate. And uh, so you can generalize this again. Aggregating uh, data, uh, you can aggregate small amounts of data, and you can aggregate huge amounts of data in the end. Uh, you have one number uh, instead of where you have um, hundreds or millions or billions of events. But I think so, the norm is still to display histograms and, and line charts. So if you took some kind of reports, and uh, like the first graph that I always see is histograms, line charts, like this, because everybody just knows it, and it's just so easy to grasp. Yeah, so. I mean, if you if you really want to plot every uh data point there is um of course you will have a, a problem and, and uh, if you don't do any aggregation uh because then you uh, there is probably not even uh st because of uh, any statistical variances there's probably not even uh, a huge point in uh, plotting every data point there is uh, but uh, for example a histogram uh, is is already an aggregation so i don't see why you shouldn't be able to use it or why you 
uh, should treat it differently when, when the data sizes are huge. So, Bernardo, Stefan, do you have a <laughs> uh, late coming, Stefan? Do you have also an opinion about the topic or do you agree with another? Without a... on, on, on this, I, I would agree. Yeah. yeah. So, so the um, visualization um, keeps, keeps the same um, over the years. Um, but nowadays, but with, with much more data. Uh, in the end of the day, but uh, we are seeing more and more, um, yeah, real-time visualization, which are actually uh, changing um, uh, in real time, uh, on and not like like a couple of years back, only um, on a triggered reload. Uh, I think that would be mm -hmm. a significant change. Sure, sure. So. Uh... Let me step to the next community question, because it's also a bit about of monitoring and so on. If you're talking about charts, monitoring is also part of it. No? So uh, from Koji, I am one. Uh, how do you monitor your big data jobs or slash streams? Does somebody has an... Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe how to monitor just Kafka streams and Spark streaming application is quite interesting. Specifically, or okay, in, in the end, I, I don't want to be the first one talking again. So, if anyone <laughs> else wants to go ahead, so uh, just to answer the, the question generally, I'd say you'd use the same tools that you already use to monitor anything else in your IT because you might already have your preferences and you don't want to change that. Uh, and if you if you cannot use those tools because you hit certain limitations such as as Raphael mentioned uh, Kafka uh, where you need special tools uh, there is there uh, where where also for example uh, again some advertisement uh, Cladera provides some some tools to uh, where you can exactly see um, what are the producers and what are the consumers uh, the events, um, you can uh, get sample events with a nice user interface. So uh, I'd say there's a mix of uh, traditional monitoring tools that you already are using um, in your IT and everyone, everyone has hopefully monitoring tools. And then there is uh, some specialized tools uh, that come with the enterprise versions um, of, of the software of, of uh, the open source distributors. Okay. Thanks. So maybe now to the currently last uh, uh, community question, also from a fan of mine, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> so from Latsen Fan 101, uh, for dashboard purposes, are there different tools that are used instead of Grafana? Maybe this is a topic for Bernhard, I think, because you are using a BI tool and you have talked about it currently. <laughs> Um, yeah, dashboarding purposes, it's, uh, it's also uh, one of the fast growing areas in uh, the big data landscape. So there are plenty uh, out of, uh, ones out of there. For example, uh, the traditional Microsoft fitted Power BI, or it can be also Tableau or Click or MicroStrategy, just to name a few. Uh, Grafana in that sense is more or less the answer or banana, depends on from the open source perspective. And um, yeah, I mean, they are addressing also this, uh, I want to visualize the data uh, in a different way. So they also have the strengths and the weaknesses. Cool. Does somebody else have an opinion on the topic? Or is it actually all the same? I think everybody agree on it. <laughs> BI tools are BI tools. And Very tools. agreeable, yeah. <laughs> Cool, cool. I mean, uh, to to stress it a little bit out of there, that's the first first point where you uh, contract your businesses, independent where your big data journey. So you always have here this reporting uh, use cases somehow. Um, so I think it's one crucial part, at least from a business perspective. Yeah. So um, maybe let's step right into a next main question. So we have the maturity. Now it's uh, 
favorite question that Peter gave me before the talk, actually. It's a quite good question. <laughs> Is a classic data warehouse an extension for a big data appliance or an alter alternative? And where are the boundaries? So should I start so, to answer? <laughs> maybe, maybe yes, because <laughs> it could be a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so pretty much I gave you the question because I don't have the answer really myself. So it's a little bit from the, I think from the history, it like, so th there is, in, in the beginning there was like the, the, the classical, um, the classical applications on the one hand and on the other hand, the, the data warehouse. And then um, it was, was always batch processing and, and reports later on in the data warehouse and everything you need right away in the, in the front end. And then there were the used cases which you need right away or, or pretty soon, but um, so, so you, but your application can't handle it because it's it's too much data, and then you you put it to the to the um, to the big data um, store, and that's still for some use cases that this is still like the case that it's like not in between the application and the data warehouse, but just for a whole different set of use cases. But I think where it's where it's moving is just to be like a, a intermediate state where you do um, either your your stream processing use cases and and your 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 stuff um, which your classical applications just can't handle, or you do your pre-processing for your data warehouse because it's just um, already overloaded um, and and already um, I mean as soon as you move into the data warehouse you have usually all the all the transformations already done to the to the business data model that it's really nice to look at so it's it's like the sweet spot for big data is like processing so like the on the one hand the pre-processing and the enrichment for the data warehouse on the other side all your fancy um, real-time stuff and and near time um, use cases you need pretty soon so it, so I, I think it's moving like in this place in between the applications and the data warehouses. I mean, it's quite interesting this question simply because I was previously working for Teradata, which is uh, one of the classical database vendors. I mean, is the classical data warehouse an extension for big data? Probably yes. Is it an alternative? Probably no. Um, it also depends on us uh, on so. Uh, if you abstract the data warehouse from that perspective, what is it? It is at least uh, some sort of standardized schema on top of, of data. Uh, whereas if I look on big data, it's um, this typically schema on read as uh, independent of the data that is coming in, I store it somewhere and uh, very later on uh, on the schema. And this very later on, on for the schema means basically uh, that uh, the extract of the data has not been defined yet. So at some sort, um, I would uh, rather say it as an extension simply because at the end of the day, you want to have some uh, uh, extracts out of the data independent and uh, these extracts of course are somehow uh, schematized at some point. So maybe an, a little invoice before I give over to you, Stefan. Uh <laughs> Uh, the question might be rephrased. Is the need for a classical data warehouse, if fast distributed database is technology available, making pre-processing to some degree redundant? Maybe it is also uh, that's that's a good that's a good input to what I wanted to say, or at least it helps me um, put the words together. So thanks for Gitra. <laughs> uh, funniest names today. Um, so the, the thing is, a lot of companies already have classical data warehouses and they have um, maybe even more than one and they, they might be huge and they have very business critical applications running on top uh, that, that work and that give them business value every day. So um, it's probably not possible to, to remove those uh, and just um, use another technology from now on because they were always supposed to be a single source of truth for the company, which in a lot of cases they are not. So the most important thing is 
uh, to when you look into this, I think is that you uh, try to make uh, your single source of truth uh, not dependent on where you store the data, but make mm -hmm. sure that that you know where the data is stored at all times and providing some kind of data catalog, uh, some functionality to to make sure that yeah, that um, if you need some data, uh, you can trust the data and you can trust the data source, no matter if it's um, stored uh, in the cloud or on an open source uh, data warehousing engine or on Oracle or on Teradata, wherever. So that's that's my take on it. Yeah, here is some, also an input from my side. If you argue over the data catalog or on the business graph, sorry. So please keep in mind that different people have different views on the data. And for example, uh, usually what you have in companies is that uh, some sort of department has a, uh, at that point something stored on the data warehouse that represents their view on the data. And that's also the reason why I think it's an extension. Mm -hmm. So it's here the tight coupling of the business context onto, uh, onto the view of the data. Yeah, in, in the end uh, you, uh, in the end, the, the, the view on the data is, is different, but the origin where the data is, um, comes from might sometimes be the same. And that's why it makes it even more important to, to have uh, the lineage tracked uh, end to end to see, okay, this, this business department is using this view on the data. Uh, and the, the other one might use a slightly different one but you can really tra uh, track down and trace down to the origin of the sources and see um, where where the differences are and see where uh, in the end where you are, yeah, why 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 the, the, the this one calculation it looks different on, on one platform and, and uh, different on the other one. Yes, yeah, so probably. I, all, yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, of um, data lake and, and data warehouse more in a sense of coexisting, um, because we we have uh, quite. Um, a couple of uh, new projects um, implementing a data warehouse. Um, there are actually still companies out there. They have no data warehouse so far. And but I think um, most of the projects they they are starting right away also with a combined data warehouse um, and and data lake um, data um, data warehouse lake or something. Uh, like this, they 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 calling it. So I I, I think I'm I'm yeah I, I'm thinking uh, in a way of of coexisting. I, I I would call it in in this sense. I I think both as as already mentioned, both have their special use cases, and um, I I think this will stay on for both sides. Yeah. So and also so what I want wanted to 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 add is that also um, uh, so for a lot of a lot of projects that, that i saw a lot of clients that a lot of people are actually struggling with their current big data warehouses because they are putting a lot of so usually if if big companies have data warehouses they're pretty huge and they're pretty old and nobody nobody dares to even touch the processing in there because they cramped already so much functionality in there that they're just totally overloaded. So and I think that's um, where uh, shifting a little more. So, so not not because usually what you have is you have all the use cases from from your applications downstream. But I think um, for for a lot of companies it would also be helpful to look the other way around. So what can I shift from my classical data warehouse processing? Up to the to, to a big data cluster to to um, reduce the load on the data data warehouse and maybe um, reduce this really long batch runs, which takes sometimes a couple of days to to get my my data warehouse um, up to date um, to to a little more faster and to more um, usable um, scales. 
So um, let's get to the last question of the day. Then we will have a sh uh, this last question to the community, actually, um, because we are leaking of time. Um, so maybe in a quick yes or no, or with some answer, uh, will be there a no one on-premise data center in 10 years? That's the basic cloud question. <laughs> so, yeah, we had that. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So I think, cool. Um, Thanks uh, for everyone who joined this uh, live stream. Thanks for you for answering the question of the community as well from our que uh, questions. Um, maybe let's uh, get to the last question for the community because this is actually our first meetup of this group. So we want to get uh, the feedback what we should do next. And for this reason, we have uh, put up a little question and some topics you maybe be interested. Um, so. Um, we have we have here some couple of uh, topics for the next meetup. So, what would you like to see next time? Can we also vote? Sure, sure. <laughs> vote, vote, vote for it. We can also speak in the next next meetup. So <laughs> I'm open for that. <laughs> let me let me open Slido. <laughs> oh, <laughs> event driven architecture. Good that we have a good architect for that topic. <laughs> so uh, the roadmap of the software engineering, interesting. Cool, cool. Mm. <laughs> ah, some other hints. <laughs> Nobody wants open source <laughs> because, <laughs> but everybody use it. <laughs> they they don't want to hear me again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, enough. Isn't isn't that always the case with open source? Everyone wants to use it. No one wants to contribute. Yeah. Oh, you see, so, someone wants to contribute. <laughs> Ten percent. <laughs> Nobody wants a tech radar. <laughs> But wasn't there wasn't there something at TechRadar just a moment ago? Yeah, you can edit your response and switch your opinion. Actually, I don't know, but we had this discussion this week with some colleagues, and we said, "Hey, would it be nice to just talk a bit about upcoming stuff and news and this whole stuff?" And TechRadar is always a nice nice thing to view if you're talking about new frameworks that could be the thing for the next couple of months. So hmm. it seems like the community wants event-driven architecture for the next meetup. So we will follow your, we will do this topic the next time, actually. Cool. Great topic. So, yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, cool. Ah, someone wants to take radar. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. So um, thank you for watching, everyone. Uh, thanks for the contribution of the speakers. Um, if there are any qu questions, maybe let's uh, sum it up with a short Q&A if somebody wants to. Let's wait a minute. Uh, hopla. Maybe this thing will help. Cool. Somebody wants to say something to give a hint or I don't know. Any questions? Uh, so, thanks for having me, I guess. <laughs> it was, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, I was happy that everyone joined today. I think it was a nice first meetup. Sadly, it was online. Maybe next time in real person, so we can grab a beer afterwards. It would be easier. But Corona is limiting all the live events currently, so it's easier to, to make this in the online environment. But I hope this panel discussion was something new instead of a normal uh, online webinar that we have all, all the time currently. Up. So uh, thank you for everyone that joined. And uh, have a good night. <laughs> good night. So I also have to thank you and yeah, see you hopefully soon. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.